Please help me welcome Mr. Casey Chu. He holds a BA um, in Ethnic Studies from Sarah Lawrence, and he also works with Hyphen. He's recently appointed Mr. Hyphen um, 2010, and as you may know, Hyphen advocates for more API exposure in media. So please welcome Kyle Chu. Thanks, yeah. So those movies are out of the tag. All of them, like for real. <laughs> Anyways, I'm Kyle Casey Chu, but you can call me Kyle. Um, it's awesome to be here today. Thank you guys for inviting me. Um, so since June, I've been working with CAM, or Center for Asian American Media, right over there, as a San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival intern. We've been working on managing the call for entries, getting in touch with a lot of cool filmmakers, and uh, ironing out logistics for the upcoming coming festival, and it's been really rad. Um, I enjoyed working with Cam so much that I wanted to represent them in the Mr. Hyphen 2010 pageant. The Mr. Hyphen pageant is an annual competition that celebrates Asian American men who are committed to breaking stereotypes and empowering our community through nonprofit work and social activism. The pageant is held by Hyphen Magazine, a Bay Area based Asian American arts, culture, and politics publication founded in 2002. It's also hella rad. <laughs> So when I won the pageant, I realized that my cause to break negative Asian American stereotypes in the media was something that resonated with many others. As I know it, to be Mr. Hyphen means that you can expose your community to issues you feel are politically and personally important. And discuss what can be done to realize this vision. Sorry. So I'm here today to talk about Asian stereotypes in the media. But first things first. Besides being Mr. Hyphen, you should also know I'm queer and Chinese American. And while I could tell you I was born and raised in San Francisco, it would be more accurate to say that Hollywood and mainstream American media was the one that really raised me. When I was little, my favorite movie was Three Ninjas. <laughs> three Ninjas is about three white boys who retreat to the suburbs every summer to learn martial arts from their Asian grandfather. How they're related, I have no idea. <laughs> so after seeing this movie maybe a bajillion times, I was at eight years old, thoroughly convinced that my own grandpa was a kung fu master. I'm serious. I'm quite serious. So every weekend, I asked him to teach me how to do like flying kicks or whatever. Right? And every weekend, he would have a good-natured laugh at my naivety. He'd be like, "Oh, you're so stupid." And I was just like, "How can you be Chinese and not know martial arts?" That's how powerful film and media was, and on some level, still is to me. Media is supposed to reflect our realities. And whether or not we are readily aware, we interact with media every day. Media is, by definition, mass communication. This includes, but is not limited to, the internet, radio, advertisements, publications, television, and of course, film. Media is what kept us updated play-by-play -play this year when the Giants won the World Series. It has the power to shape verdicts in important political events, such as the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982, or more recently, the Oscar Grant case. To take it even closer to home, some form of media, Facebook or Twitter, probably, has informed all of us of the event we're in attendance of at this very moment. I have a question. How many of you have been to Antarctica? Okay, I did not expect that. Except for this guy, right over here, who is making so, so much trouble. Um, consider what you know of the place. So I think of vast snowscapes, freezing temperatures, maybe nowadays like a really sad looking polar bear on an ice cube, or something like that. Now consider this. Everything you know, or you think you know of Antarctica, you probably garnered from the media. Like National Geographic, the Planet Earth series, or Wikipedia. Right? Am I right? Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> Point is, even though we haven't seen it with our own eyes, we take all the information we've gathered of Antarctica to be true. Media is powerful in this way. In the US, there are about 15 million Asian Americans out of 307 million total Americans, according to the 2009 census. This means there's a good chance that someone living in an area with few Asian Americans, Asian Americans included, might not have ever had an in the flesh encounter with an Asian American. It means that to some Americans, this Asian American face is like Antarctica. This means that 
every form of media with an Asian American face attached counts. That every magazine article, every image from every TV show or film with an Asian American actor or actress may be assumed as truth. As a college freshman in 2006, I had the opportunity for the first time in my life to take an Asian American film course. That course changed the way I looked at everything. After studying stereotypes of Asian Americans from yellow apparel images of the 1890s all the way to the model minorities of the 1960s, I couldn't help but relate what I was studying to what I was watching on screen. I found that these allegedly age-old Asian stereotypes, for example, of evil-willed and untrustworthy Asian gangsters, of perpetual foreigners who still, after a century of living here, cannot speak or understand English, of castrated and effeminized calculator-wielding Asian math nerds, are not ancient history, but in fact still thriving and well. Recently I noticed how in the movie The Hangover, there were three Asian gangster characters cast. During a confrontation in the desert between the Asian gangsters and the white protagonists, one of the gangsters, played by Ken Jeong, grabbed his crotch menacingly and said, why don't you suck on these little Chinese nuts? Hello, whack, right? Not only does Jeong play a gangster stereotype that harks back to the evil criminal genius of Fu Manchu and the like, but he also draws attention to another sexually castrating Asian stereotype, a myth I'm sure we're all very familiar with sucks. The small talk reference really upsets me because it emasculates not only Asian American men, but all Asian men. That's nearly a fifth of the world. This stereotype continues to falsely and unjustly denigrate our physical and sexual value by judging us against a white standard of beauty. In regard to the model minority stereotype, there are a lot of examples, but a good one is in Mean Girls, where the majority of the math leads, which is a competitive math team, are all Asian American, right? And when main character Katie Heron considers joining the math leads, her best friend admonishes against it, deeming them as social suicide. And I don't know about you, but like, when I meet people, I totally want people to think I'm a math lead. <laughs> Except not really. So it doesn't matter to me how many of us excel in math. I mean, I don't, but that's beside the point. What matters is that not all of us do. Some of us hate math. Some of us are very sociable. And some of us are very sexy. <laughs> okay, so these are only a handful of stereotypes, right? Yet I've noticed at times that these images have spoken for me before I've even opened my mouth. On my first day at college, this girl asked me where I was from, and I told her San Francisco. Later on in the same conversation, she told me I had a very good I spoke very good English because I didn't have an accent. <laughs> then, back when I was a junior in high school, I was at a rock concert. The music was loud and I was yelling and jumping. And I must have hit the guy next to me because he looked annoyed. So I ignored him. I ignored him. And that was when he, was com he felt compelled to tell me to shut the F up and be quiet like the rest of you. Prejudiced instances like these are difficult for me to just shrug off. Every time something like this happens, I feel as if I've been disarmed, that no matter what I say, I've already been accounted for. It's disheartening to think that when approaching a guy or a girl we like, when applying for a job, <coughs> when interviewing for a leadership position, that these images may contribute to the situation's outcome. But I know that these images are bigger than me, that whether or not we choose to acknowledge it, these images affect all of us in countless ways. So what can we do about it? How can we ensure that there are characters and tropes on screen that represent the real us and that we can be proud to associate with? My answer is this. We need to tell our own stories in our own voices. We need to continue being the writers. We need to continue being the writers, the filmmakers, the actors, and the artists we are, and expose our audiences to reality as we know it. We need more Harold and Kumars, more Rufios from Hook, more flaming bisexual, tattoo-covered Margaret Cho's who are unafraid to tell the world what they think in spite of these stereotypes. We need to let everyone know, Asian America included, that we are leagues deeper than the stereotypes that falsely dictate our potentials and limitations. In telling our own stories, we will welcome the world to a three-dimensional, truthful, and more human perspective of who we are.
and in telling our stories, I know that these myopic stereotypes will shatter in the face of truth.